from San Jose, in the heart of Silicon Valley, it's theCUBE, covering Big Data SV 2016. Welcome back everybody, Jeff Frick here with theCUBE. We're wrapping up day one at Big Data SV in downtown San Jose. We've had a great lineup of guests, practitioners, a lot of technology people, um, some leaders that are you know, kind of leading the way. We had Pexada on that actually launched their company in 2013 on theCUBE, which is fun to get an update from them. But now we're going to kind of have a, a little round table, a little wrap kind of review what we heard, what we think. And so we, uh, we've got the whole team here. We've got George Gilbert, uh, Wikibon big data analyst and, and analytics analyst, uh, Peter Burris, our newest addition, running all the research now for, um, for Wikibon. And of course, everybody's favorite, John Furrier, founder uh, of SiliconANGLE and, and SiliconANGLE Media. So first off, guys, great day. Terrific uh, a lineup of guests. I think there wasn't a lot going on anywhere in San Jose except for here on the Cube today. <laughs> they started late across the street. I think they have their they opened the exhibit hall. At we seven. pumped out more Cube gems and Cube cards and Cube interviews and all content combined here in Silicon Valley. I think if you go to Cube gems, Twitter hashtag Cube gems or Cube cards, great interviews, Jeff. I was I was uh, very impressed with the guests we had this this day, and we got two more days of this. So again, on the ground, right on the front lines of all the actions. I thought there were some great points being made and a lot of insights coming out of theCUBE. And again, you're seeing the, you know, a lot of signal coming out of this market where I was skeptical, you know, two years ago, I was really much looking at this and, and kind of thinking that there was not a lot happening and that the flowers weren't blooming. Going back to Mike Olson's 2011 uh, speech when he announced with Ping Lee from Excel Partners that they had a $100 million fund for big data apps. Big data apps just never happened. And so, you know, going back to 2013, even just a couple of years ago, I'm like, this thing might not hunt. This thing is, the dogs are not chasing down the right value proposition. So Hadoop might not happen, you know, all the uncertainty. And cause, but, but really kind of, I'm, I'm encouraged because that was just kind of the shifting of the winds. And it's clear that the momentum in big data is there. We see IoT and it's finally crossed over. And I think that you have a tailwind in this market where big data and analytics and the software is just not about Hadoop, it's about the diversity, and it's about the cloud. The cloud is the engine of innovation. All the companies that I talked to that I was impressed the most with were the ones that had uh, either innovative licensing models and or pure cloud deployments. That is going to enable a slew of analytics, and I just think that you know, the mature technology pieces coming together is phenomenal, and you're going to start to see the path to business value and ultimately the operationalizing of it. Yeah, I think that integration with cloud is really a huge enabler for big data. We had Marcy Campbell on from uh, Kubel, and she said basically you know, they're running their application. It's a cloud-only application. It's just on Azure, AWS, and, and uh, Google Cloud Platform, so cloud, clearly a big piece of the, of the puzzle. But let's jump in, uh, ask you, Peter, why, why didn't we have the app thing happen and what's been happening instead? Well, I think there's a number of reasons why we didn't have the app thing and I think it uh, also leads into the observation I have about what was very interesting about today. And one of the reasons why the app thing didn't happen is because to build an application, you have to, at least historically, know something about the underlying process. And so it's pretty easy to go from understanding accounting to building an accounting, accounting application, or understanding HR to building an HR application. It's very different to go from understanding the customer to building a what does what for the customer. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges is that we're, uh, application development has historically presumed a data model, and then we've built other things around it. And here we're talking about not presuming a data model, and rather just loading data in and finding insights. And I think that leads to, at least for me, one of the big takeaways, which was uh, we heard a common theme from everybody, even as we heard multiple different approaches to how to go about do it. And that common theme is we have to make this easier. We really have to find ways to make it easier. A recognition that there is business value that's being generated by this tool set uh, episodically, periodically with a lot of heavy lifting, uh, but that we need to make it easier to actually use the tools and integrate them together. I know that's a big theme of your, George, but also we have to do a better job of bringing the community into how these tools are used, make them easier to end, for end users, make them uh, less onerous, less dependent upon data science uh, or data scientists and the magicians associated with big data. We probably heard that uh, probably the eight or nine guests we had today, we probably heard that out of seven of them. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that. A buddy of mine, Martin Crew from Bootstrap Marketing, longtime industry vet, 
couple of years ago, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to Hadoop World. And I talked to Bill Shapiro. I was like, what's Hadoop? You know, and he's, he's like, he rolls his eyes. He's like, there just aren't that many Hadoop people to implement for the buzz. So I want to ask you, George, you spend your, your days, you know, buried in this stuff. What's your takeaway from today? What are some of the surprises that you, uh, that you heard that you didn't expect? Well, my, my favorite analogy is, you know, Noah shepherded all the animals onto the ark two by two. Um, and basically with, with uh, Hadoop, we, we, we also have a zoo. They come in threes because of high availability. And we also have three zookeepers, you know, to, to keep them uh, sort of shepherded, shepherd all the animals in the Hadoop, um, in, in the Hadoop zoo together. We're beginning to hear people um, solve some of that complexity. Sometimes it's in the cloud and they can shield some of that from the admin side. And uh, we, we see some uh, on the tool side addressing the, the data complexity. Um, but I think everyone understands that this is um, the first pattern um, that we have to master in terms of getting, uh, borrowing from Peter, we, we have to s sort of learn to extract um, questions that we didn't know we didn't know about, and once those are repeatable, um, those when they're repeatable, we can start building applications around them. The ones where we can take uh, customer interactions and we can anticipate and influence them, um, and that that takes the data lake and rather than the ad hoc activities on a very complex foundation, that makes the data lake more of a, a production platform for repeatable insights in the form of predictive models. And, and I think when we get here, you know, next year, we'll probably be a good deal closer to, to that pattern where we'll start hearing customers or vendors and customers saying um, that's within sight. Yeah, Ninshad gave us 250 billion reasons why that's important too. Um, <laughs> I want to go back to you, John, really talking about the business value. I think it's, it's kind of interesting when, when people talk about Hadoop, it's always Cloudera and Hortonworks and, you know, Jack Norris would be remiss if we didn't mention Matt Barb. He's just busy out, you know, selling customers and, and doing his thing. But we had Series A uh, funded companies today, mm -hmm. Series B funded companies today, and Series C funded companies today. So clearly a broad range of innovation kind of bucking the, the trend where money's a little bit harder to find. How do you see kind of the opportunity for new companies to drive innovation and, and find new places to deliver business value? This is the holy grail right now in the market. And the, and the theme that came up was new, and Peter has been, been teasing it out on the intro, and uh, we came out a couple of interviews, was the valuation of the data. That came up to be a big deal. And I bring that up in context to your question because the data now is super valuable, and there's no real methodology and practices, some of the other than stuff that Wikibon's putting uh, uh, some research around, is how do you value the data in practice to business value? And so I think that the opportunity for startups and companies is going to take a long tail distribution, meaning uh, in the old days, back in the client server days, you know, with Oracle and these big companies, there was a renaissance of application development. And those application developers were full stack, full siloed companies that went public. People saw and the list goes on and on. Then they got consolidated away. I think you're going to see a similar thing now where it's a thousand flowers bloom. We're going to see, a, I believe we'll see an application renaissance, probably not the way that Mike Olson thought it would be, but I think you're going to see prepackaged, unique domain expertise applications that sit on someone else's cloud or stack that provides value. So you're going to see uh, little boutique-like profitable companies, like cash flow uh, type companies, and then you're going to see people that can really add significant value and pick the use case. We had InterAna on, which was very impressive. Their large-scale pattern recognition, that is a platform-like business, not just a tool or using analytics. So again, you're going to have a range of long tail from really big, powerful, popular, highly valued companies down to into a niche market of apps that do a great specific thing with data. And I think fundamentally, it comes back down to the value, the value of the data, multiple data sources, and then some sort of power source, aka cloud. So I think you're seeing now the, that maturity take place, and that's the path I see enterprises wanting to, wanting to take and trying to figure out how to get there, whether you call it DevOps, mobile first, whatever, and then ultimately the cloud powers it. So, you know, Peter, a lot of things that you've been, you've been talking about in, in, in your research, I see happening. I think it's a great opportunity. And if you don't have value, you don't have customers, you don't have revenue. And that's why the market today is confused on who's worth what, because they can't value the data. And if someone's not thrown off cash, they will be either accu-hired or go out of business. 
Peter, I want to go back to you. I think you actually had the comment of the day today. At least it, it really struck me, and I hadn't heard it before, which is really comparing data scientists to uh, chauffeurs or operators. You know, that's not the, switchboard the right operators, way. Switchboard operators, chauffeurs, et cetera. Not the way to really think about the problem. That's fine, and, and, I, and I like that. But I want to go down a different path with you right now. When we had Amit Walia on from Informatica, he went through a laundry list of, of historical databases and historical infrastructure, really, in the context of things continue to change. But there's a high-level theme that you've mentioned before, and I want you to dig into it, which is really, at its most fundamental, schema at read versus schema at write. How is the ability to flip that model impacting what people can do with this technology? Oh, it's had enormous impacts, and I, I talked a little bit about uh, uh, the idea of uh, the degree to which you know something about the schema in advance versus not versus the question in advance. So is the model uncertain or certain, and is the set of questions certain or uncertain? Uh, there have always, there's always been a need to be able to address problems where that didn't lend themselves automatically to a data model-like uh, structure, but we didn't have the technology to do it. And so the way it's flipping is a couple of things. I think we can start off by the conversation we've been having about developers. First, the historical model for development started with the idea of understanding your data, whether it was back in the days of COBOL or, or you know, more recently Java, you end up taking a look at the data, modeling the data, understanding the data, and use that as a basis for then you know, creating a persistent data store that the application went off against. Um, what we're talking about here is something slightly different. We're talking about having the data be available and then asking the developers to uh, find ways of creating value out of that data without necessarily being able to start with a data model in, to begin with, uh, but yet not being wholly reliant on a data scientist to do magic. Uh, we heard a number of the Perxata uh, conversation, for example. We're going to hear more tomorrow about this. There's a whole bunch of folks coming on tomorrow that are talking about how data is going to flow across the data plane in an organization in ways that make it easier to create value out of these technologies. But it's a pretty big challenge right now, and that's one of the things that's going to happen. We're going to discover over the next few years uh, what are the problems and see the technology and the tool set fill in behind those understandings so that we end up with a real set of platform technologies that support new classes of application development. Peter, thanks for laying it up because I was just going to ask George, you know, one of these fundamental themes, and, and again, you watch this all the time, you, you're looking way down the road, and you saw this, which was Spark. And, and again, Spark's another technology, there's always another technology, but fundamentally, it's really about data at rest versus data in motion. And, and now combining them. But I want to key off something Peter said about, you know, it's harder to build apps now because all we have is a mess of data. We don't know the structure of the data where we say, okay, we're going to take an order and then, you know, credit, you know, credit check. That was a, you know, very structured way of building things. But where we probably are going to see the first apps, and, and I'll come back to Spark, um, is where we have like a little mini sort of domain where it might be, tell me, I have this data about how uh, telco customers behave. L help me predict when one is likely to churn or help me predict, uh, you know, fraud at a, with a credit card uh, check. And it's not that you're going to see big companies sort of trying to sell huge apps. It's more like someone, like a, a service-centric um, mini app provider will sell these solutions that plug into existing um, systems of record. And I think we'll see those as, as the first. And it's not clear that th those will even go across industry. Like you, the, the churn app might be, there might be one for telco, there might be another one for um, credit cards. And recommendation systems, you might have, you know, one that's good for, you know, an e-commerce site that is apparel and you might have something completely different for books. Um, not, not clear that that's the, the best example, but we, we won't see these big horizontal ERP type applications around um, uh, predictive analytics anytime soon, I don't, I don't think. Well, Chris from Data Robot, they have what, first interview of the day, I think six yeah. million uh, 
algorithms, they said, and it's, which is crazy. So to your point, you know, very highly customized for specific applications. Well, that, that data robot one was interesting. One, bots are hot in, in the world of DevOps because bots can automate things. That's a DevOps concept of orchestration. But they bring a different perspective where they're automating some of the data science things. And I liked about, what I liked about this, that interview was this notion of patterns at scale and looking at that notion. And, and the comment I liked from him was math is vertically agnostic, meaning the whole science behind big data doesn't really look at, at anything other than computing the data. So that brings back the question of the quality of the data. And so you have these opportunities to use the algorithms, machine learning, some of the math behind the science of automation, the future of AI and all this cognitive discussion certainly IBM talks about is the math. So that's vertical, not so it's a huge opportunity, but if you applied wrong, you're right, going to get right. wrong outcomes. But John, I want to ask you, I want to take you down a different path because we see lots of innovation in the technology. Um, but probably more exciting for our audience is innovation around the business models. You know, when we talk about, you know, Ryan said that, that the Caesars uh, data was worth a billion dollars. Unfortunately, they didn't know until after they went bankrupt. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting innovation. The, the, the story, I love the cell phone connecting to the smart cities so they can manage the traffic patterns, which I'm so tired of hearing about people churning their cell phone. Um, you know, but there's innovation on the business models too. So what are some of your, your thoughts as we've explored that with some of the guests? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the areas that certainly is not unpacked as much as it should be in my opinion. I think the business model innovation is just as historic as some of the technology enablement that we're seeing in the maturization of the tech. The business model things is interesting, and here's why I like it. it we are living in an era of doing something in a new way. Everything that, that I like and that gets my attention is companies that are doing things in a new way, not the old way, or if they're doing it in the old way, they're, they're coexisting in the old way with legacy systems or whatnot, but they're doing something new whether it's looking at the progression of digital, which is Intersana, I love that notion, they have huge clients, they have uh, you know, Tinder, Reddit, these big web scale companies, billions and billions of things going on a day, and looking at patterns. That involves real-time streaming, that requires a lot of tech, but the fact that it's the business model that's driving their innovation, not the tech, it's the reverse of what most people will think. So you're gonna see innovations around that, and that's gonna spawn a new class of business models, in my opinion, beyond what we see with cloud, which is subscription-based SaaS. There's a ton of documentation out there on SaaS business models. Certainly that's relevant, but I think you're going to start to see a new transactional business model. And this is something that Peter and I have been talking with Dave Vellante around, looking at how to put research around that because it is not a siloed vertical app. It's really the vertical app is the application, but there's a DevOps, there's orchestration, there's a lot of stuff going on to make that new way monetizable. That's the business value. So to me, I think the business model innovation in and of itself is a massive conversation. It's a great, it's a huge concept. Peter, your thoughts on that? Because I mean, yeah. we were just talking about that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, there's, a, there's a small piece about the business model of taking open source software and finding new ways of creating value with it so that folks are willing to pay for some set of services. But there's even the bigger question of business model. And one of the things that I find absolutely fascinating is that for the first 10, 15 years of this uh, web-based businesses, most of the business models were predicated on advertising. And it was almost like everybody was acknowledging, well, we're really not delivering any real value here, and so people will use it, and, but they're not going to pay for it because nobody will pay for it. As big data starts to turn the crank, and as we learn how to utilize the crowd, as we uh, find new ways of adding data uh, so that the services are, are more pointed, more specific, more personalized, we may start to see a flipping of that. And also as we recognize as individuals that privacy matters and that the data that we are giving up as we uh, use some of these free services uh, might also be uh, something of a burden to us in the long term. So watching that big picture data model flips uh, which may which may be happening. I mean, some of the conversations about Apple and the FBI and others, it it that we we may start we may be seeing this first shift in the idea of we're going to make all the services are going to be monetized through advertising versus hey let's find ways to actually create something that's valuable enough so that people want to use it. You know that's a great point, Jeff. I'll just add to that color to that is my my feeling that I've been I've been trying to figure out how to talk about this publicly, but you just gave me some ideas in, about how to talk about it. Is that if you look at all the past two years, every keynote we go to, Uber, Airbnb, everyone uses that kind of as a poster child of what the, their future could be. And ultimately, if you look at it, Uber's success is not really translating to the Uber of blank. It's really not. I mean, you're seeing some use cases of it, but Uber in and of itself is a unique. 
uh, instance of time between the right architecture, the right team, the right business idea, all around a right context. Oh, yeah, that's it. It's the context. Uber as a context is extremely well defined. And, and so, so that was kind of, like, I want to say lucky. It was just a good timing of people who had a good view on something. I think in this big data world that we're living in right now, this, this show, this event, this market, there will be an Uber-like company that times the business opportunity that they see with the right architecture, with the right data sets, whether it's how they decouple it. And I think that company will emerge. I don't think it's out here right now. I think, I don't see anyone with that explosive combination. And I think the opportunity for startups and entrepreneurs is there's an opportunity out there while the tides are shifting that there will be an Uber-like company that will emerge out of this marketplace. And I well, think that's going to be pretty phenomenal. Yeah, let's talk, and you may be right, John. Uh, there, there's a counter argument to that because uh, of the overall complexity. But I think the key point is, as we find ways to simplify, that's where the new value yeah. is going to be created. And so one of the things to think about is, you know, think about, for, you know, for example, Uber. And this is something that our research is looking at right now, uh, whether it's Uber or whether it's Airbnb or something like Facebook. Uh, we talked about it this morning. Context really matters. What is it that people go are going to do together? Facebook, great context. Stay in touch with your friends. Has not translated into other business models. Uber, great context. Get a ride. As a social network, drivers, uh, people who want rides coming together, has not translated into other businesses. Maybe it will. So context is really, really crucial. And being able to capture information about what it means to work with others better than anybody else is one of the central features of big data as we move forward. And it's what will or will not facilitate the emergence of some of these new business models. All right, I'm going to cut you off right there, Peter. We're, ru we're running low on time. And I'm going to give George as our big data analyst the last word. But what I'm curious is if you're going to get in an arm wrestling match with Brian Gracely, our cloud analyst, because what is leading the charge here? Is it big data? Is it cloud? Can the two be separated, or, or um, it just I, seems I like they're so intimately they are, intertwined? They are linked, and I, I wouldn't want to arm wrestle them because I'd probably lose, but <laughs> um, I think the, the way they're feeding on each other is that the cloud is simplifying a lot of the um, administrative and the develop, development complexity that our previous generation and current generation of big data technologies exhibits. And I've said for a long time that... Um, you know, Hadoop has to answer the challenge of simplification because the main cloud vendors, um, all three of them, you know, Amazon, a Azure, and Google, they are building a set of services that were designed to work together. They were designed, built, tested, um, integrated, uh, delivered, and operated as a unit or increasingly as a unit. And as I keep saying, you know, the zoo, you know, that comes out of the, the Apache uh, pen, those were not designed all to work together. People are bending tools around it, but you can see the seams. And, you know, you, you talk to customers who are evaluating cloud vendors, they'll say, yes, you know, long term, that would be the competition, what those cloud vendors supply as native services. So we're going to go all night. Uh, but we're going to turn off the lights and the cameras. If you'd like to join us, we'll be downstairs at the Fairmont having a, 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 a frosty malted adult beverage probably. So you're welcome to come by, or you can come by tomorrow. We're in the Gold Room. Party. You can come by tomorrow night at our party. We kick off at a, a 4.30 uh, reception for about a half hour. Then Peter's going to go with his presentation. We've got a great uh, vendor panel. We've got a great customer panel, and we'll have some... Uh, tasty food and, and drink after that. So you're welcome to come by. You can also come by during the day. We've got refreshments, a comfortable place to work, uh, and coffee. So we're excited. These guys could go forever. We're going to go for two more days. So uh, save, save some of that dry powder. And uh, thanks for watching. I'm Jeff Frick. We are live downtown San Jose, Big Data SV. It's Big Data Week. You're watching the Cube. It's Dave. It didn't come with us this time. Sorry, Dave. We miss you. Uh, people are looking out for you. It's Peter. It's John. It's George. We're missing Stu and Brian. There's more cloud than you guys thought. You're going to have to come next year. I'm Jeff Frick. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow. Keep it here on SiliconAngle.tv.